Welcome back to the three-hour news show. You're watching our sector segment, see the stories. Now, I have a question uh, for you, Yanni, or oh, for, uh, me. From, okay. uh, for you, who, uh, wherever you are watching at the moment. <laughs> How many scientists from Indonesia do you know? Uh, think... If you ask me, because the only scientist that I'm familiar oh, with wait, wait. is Coldplay. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, think, I think every Indonesian will answer this one. I think the only one or the the one that comes to mind mm. would be the late BJ Habibie. Because he was Bapa Technology. Exactly. He, he he considered to be one of the Indonesia's um, scientists. Um, prominent scientists. Yeah. So speaking of Indonesian scientists, we have Dr. Bagus Mulyadi, coordinator for UK Indonesia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Sciences and also Assistant Professor at the University of Nottingham. Hello! Dr. Muliadi, thank, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. Wow. <laughs> now, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking um, to a true scientist now. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, Doctor, first of all, um, can you tell us what uh, interdisciplinary science is? Ah, oh, okay. Um, it is not something that we are accustomed to because of mm. our culture and the way we do formal education. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, when you try to model using mathematical equations some physical uh, phenomena, mm. like the way termites, you know those little yeah, creatures, yeah, termites yeah. build nests, yeah. and then uh, they regulate their temperatures. Mm. You know, so sophisticatedly <clears throat> that they can make buildings better than we can make buildings. Mm. Now, if you try to model that with mathematics, that's one example of interdisciplinarity. Mm. So try to combine one or two or more Mm -hmm. disciplines in order to explain some new phenomena in mm. physics. I see. I, I, I like how you dumb it down for us. <laughs> no, no, no. no that's how, to, how to understand interdisciplinary science. No, well, please do. Yeah. That's, that's how we learn. Okay, so we know what it is. I mean, we've been saying it the whole mm -hmm. episode, right? Yes. It's like, what is this? What does it mean? But okay, so you are UK Indonesia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Sciences Coordinator. What is the focus of the consortium? The consortium is a consortium of a research-intensive university. Mm. So it's not consisted of individuals. So I work at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. So the consortium founding members are Nottingham University, Coventry, Warwick University, and then four Indonesian universities, ITB, IPB, UGM, UI. Oh. So the usual suspects. Yeah. And, and you went to ITB? I did. I graduated mm. from ITB. Mm. But this consortium is one of a kind. Um, for the first time ever, Indonesian-led consortium at the university level uh, start to create impact, and this is what we are very excited about. And I, I did graduate from ITB. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to that, you led the consortium in, the, in, in some white way. Well, I'm I'm just one of the steering committee members. Okay, uh, I'm one the of the yeah, one of the steering committee members. How does it feel to come from um, Asian country or Indonesia? Uh, in particular, and also um, uh -huh. getting into this one environment with uh, all the scientists from uh, uh, from the UK as well. Yeah, yeah, it's very daunting in the beginning. It's very intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, bear in mind that most academics with w who holds permanent positions or mm. tenured position, if you're in the US, they usually come from either the Western countries mm -hmm. or some higher rank universities and True. ended up being in the likes of Nottingham. Yeah, yeah. I came from ITB which statistically a lower rank university mm -hmm. and also from Asia mm -hmm. and then making my way all the way to the West. Yeah. So that, that, is not that is uncharacteristic on my part. But you see, when it comes to egalitarian culture, I think UK provides that, that landscape for me to uh, articulate myself and to tell them that Indonesia is a country worth your focus. Mm -hmm. uh, this consortium is having Indonesians uh, interest at heart. Um, so, when it comes to um, working with these people, all it comes down to, comes down to is your articulation. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't see anymore where you come from. Mm -hmm. If you can articulate the purpose of your endeavor so sophisticatedly, so convincingly, then they'll listen to you. Yeah. Uh, was this yeah. something that always been your target? Like, this no. is what you want to do, like the UK Indonesia Consortium? No. It, it didn't come to my mind until at least the last two years or so. Okay. I'm just a regular academic. So you write publications, yeah, you do yeah, research, yeah, you supervise yeah. PhD students, you teach. Mm -hmm. um, this diplomacy part of my work is not mm -hmm. something that I am actually paid for. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only in the last one year or so that the university starts to see the benefit of doing global engagement with Indonesia. So uh, it's something that is quite new. It, it, has, mm -hmm. it has never been something that I... That I thought about. Now, when it comes down to that, what are the results of the consortium that people can see so far? 
Yeah, so we engage uh, universities. So the idea is this. The consortium is made so that within the consortium, whose boundary is getting bigger and bigger, mm. you want to conduct teaching activities like research mm. and mobility of staff and students as if there were no geographical borders. Yeah. Mm. So you would imagine ITB professor <coughs> teaching at Nottingham mm. or uh, University of Lancaster students spending summer in, in Bogor. You know, you want to mm. see something like that. So the idea is that this culture, the research culture, get permeated within the boundary of the consortium. Mm. And then so sooner or later from, you know, unfortunately we still have all of these members in Java Islands. Yeah. Yeah. But when we include other universities in Indonesia, we want so that their research culture start to be like those of the UK universities mm. uh, for better and worse. And for the UK to start learning from the Indonesian. Mm. Now, speaking about the stuff that we produce is that we also engage the local governments. Uh, so ITB, IPB, yeah. UE, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these are in West Java. Mm -hmm. We engage West Javan government as yeah. well. When you want to create impact, you have to go beyond the boundaries of the university. You have to go directly to the local government. Yeah. So we engage the likes of West Nusa Tenggara, mm -hmm. West Java. We strike formal MOUs with them. We mm -hmm. try to translate our research within that consortium mm -hmm. to small medium enterprises in West Java. We try to help them. Expedite oh. the transportation, electrification, mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. like that. Unless and until you do that, it's very difficult to articulate the real impact to the real people. So not only you create uh, within uh, the environment of researchers and scientists, you also apply that to the to. Uh, uh, MSMEs. Yeah. But um, also when it comes to uh, what you were saying about how intimidating it was uh, mm. from Indonesian, unless one from Asian countries. Still is. Getting, still is, still is. <laughs> Now, uh, what can you tell to um, your fellow uh, scientists or the aspiring scientists in Indonesia when it comes to yeah. uh, getting in touch with uh, the other scientists in the Western countries? To get in touch with them is a lot easier now than when I was studying ah. in ITB before. Now mm. you could just, I don't know, some of them even have social media, you can follow them yes. on Instagram. Yeah, so yeah, sure. Getting in touch is trivial, Yeah, you know, but writing... Okay. Uh, so sophisticatedly, so convincingly, so that they would reply to your messages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not something that I think Indonesians are well equipped with. So, for example, let's say they want to get a PhD uh, studentship or scholarship. Yeah. Right? They want to work with UK universities and, and researchers. The first thing that came to their minds, usually, as reflected by their emails, is mm. that, can you help me? Yeah. Right. Can you help me with it? Is there opportunity? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's never about what the other guy wants. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's subtle, but it's, a, it's such a nice breaker. If I read an email mm -hmm. and the first sentence is somebody who tells me that he thinks about my problem. It's a, oh. uh, Professor A, I see that you're studying about this yeah. issues, mm -hmm. right? I might have a solution, right? My methodologies when I did my master was about this and that. This might contribute that little gesture mm. that signifies your wanting to solve my problem rather yeah. than just merely asking for mm -hmm. opportunities mm -hmm. really make the whole difference. So rather than saying, yeah. uh, can you help me? You are saying, how can I help you? Exactly. That's, that's the currency of the world. People are, are naturally pursuing their self-interest. And I think uh, nobody, want, no, nobody has time. Professors are really busy. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. First opening email is just like, is there opportunity for me? Yeah. It was just like, thanks. So the first sentence is very crucial. Yeah. Think about what the other guy wants. Mm -hmm. Okay, got to figure that. All right, so um, we talked about, um, of course, when doing this, there are so many challenges, even if you think it's not a big challenge. Mm -hmm. But can you tell oh, us yes. what kind of challenges that you have faced so far? The first challenge is institutional. I came from Indonesia, mm -hmm. and then I did my postgraduate in Taiwan. So naturally, mm -hmm. my whole postgrad education was in Asia. So I had to make my way to the West gradually. Mm -hmm. So that was difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, even when I'm teaching my students right now, I had no idea about what it feels like to be a British student. I never sat in the room I'm teaching. Right? Yeah. So that presents some challenges. The culture is also different. So most of the problems are not technical. So you have to deal with this culture of people trying to make the best out of the opportunity by telling people how great they are as a researcher, which we in Indonesia might think of it as a as a braggadocious Bra act. <laughs> like bragging. All right, like, yes. like bragging. So this cultural thing uh, really makes a difference. And when it comes to day-to-day um, -day life as a researcher, it's not just 
technical things. You have to convince people, you know. You have to mm. convince people to give you funding. You yeah. have to convince people to team up with you to mm. apply for funding. Mm. These are interpersonal things. Mm. Yeah, so it's not enough to be brilliant. If you're an aspiring academic, you have to also be able to articulate why they should work with you. And yeah. interdisciplinary, to circle back to what the whole point about yeah, having yeah. this cons consortium, interdisciplinary holds a big key. Mm. You as a geologist want to work with mathematicians because they have the tool you don't. Mm. Yeah. Right. And as a biologist, you want to work with um, environmental physicists, mm. something like that. If you don't have something to offer and you don't know how to sell it for peop to people that has very different background or discipline to you, then that's it. You know, you're just living in silos and finding opportunities will be limited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, yeah. now listening to you talking and also explain to us about the whole thing that you and your team have been doing yeah. has been so... Um, I feel like I'm back in class. Yeah, I'm back in class. <laughs> Eye opening. <laughs> Eye opening. But let's go back a long way in time, Dr. Muliadi, because uh, <laughs> our team have succeeded to... <laughs> Dig a little bit of your past oh, no. and talking about how rebellious you were. Uh, I've never, I've oh, never... Of course, your grades <laughs> probably. But um, you know, looking at, at those uh, time, and yes. now you are a scientist, researcher, an academic. How do you see yourself back then? Like, how rebellious were you? I never been to jail or anything like that. <laughs> or, you know, so I was rebellious in a way that I'm very easily distracted. Mm. I think it's part of my personality, so you know, I get very short attention span. Yeah. And then once I see things as being uninteresting, I would just go switch my attention mm. to somewhere else. You so, shift. Yeah. So that's I think the the the. I mean, some of my classmates will probably see me as being you know never attending class. <laughs> <laughs> so. What was the question? When, when that was uh, like uh, how 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 do you see yourself? Uh, back then, and how do you see yourself ah, okay. now? There's a sense of purpose now, I think, mm -hmm. that was lacking back in the days when I was just mm -hmm. wasting time. I think purpose gets you far, I think, because it, it makes you withstand heavy pressures mm -hmm. and then keep going when things get boring and keep your focus. Um, th there's a sense of purpose right now, partly because I have a family right now, mm -hmm. and also there's a some other endeavor that I'm doing that has significance to people in Indonesia. And it's very encouraging to see that bearing fruits. Uh, so, so that sense of purpose um, is what differentiates myself and Bagus 20 years ago. Is that a pivotal moment um, when you have a family and then you're um, kind of like, okay, now I get to repurpose my life <laughs> or there is another uh, pivotal moment uh, yes. for you, for Bagus Mulyadi? There wasn't one, there was maybe at least two or three mm. pivotal moments because I was not from a affluent background family. Mm. Or so, so. so when I went to Taiwan, that wasn't because I could afford it. You know, I, I never really got a government scholarship. Mm. I had to work part time to do that. Mm. Um, and then there was a time when the funding's almost run out, mm. right? And I, I was placed in a situation with my back against the wall and you either make it or you don't. And then I'm surprised, as much as everyone should, uh, about what they're act actually capable in doing when they have all the pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're at the breaking point, you know who you really are. Yeah. And for me, uh, when I was in Taiwan, I realized that I wasn't actually uh, that stupid. <laughs> you know, okay. that stupid. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was one. Another thing is I met my wife. Yeah. Uh, well, it was then my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. it was, it was then somebody else's girlfriend, but that's not important. Um, you know, let's then, not get into that. Yeah, let's not get into that. Um, well, I started to think about wanting to be in the Europe, uh -huh. in, in the European yeah. universities. Mm -hmm. And then one of the ways, one of the only ways, unless you're rich, is to get into academia, mm. right? Because I'm already in my second year of my PhD at the time, mm -hmm. and I thought this would be my ticket for a better life. Mm. And so I would stand the pressure and keep my head down and get on with it. Wow. <laughs> I love hearing this kind of I life know. story. This is very interesting. So, Dr. Mnyori, uh, please hold on right there because we'll be back with you. <laughs> yes. Because we're going on a break. Yes. See, the stories will continue after the break. And, of course, we'll continue our talk with Dr. Bagus Mulyadi. Stay tuned right here on the 3-Hour News Show on C Today. <laughs>